name is um, Melika Zral, and um, this is the last panel of, um, of the day. Um, it deals with the representation of uh, women uh, in um, democratizing politics and um, with iconic representations, but also more largely cultural practices. And uh, in the Arab Spring, particularly in um, Tunisia and Egypt, but also other cases, we have seen a um, real discursive explosion and an explosion of images. Uh, and the question for, um, for us scholars is to think about what we do with those narratives suddenly that multiply in the, in the public sphere and those images that we see everywhere. We've seen many images, videos, um, et cetera. Um, and it's um, quite astonishing that uh, in Tunisia in particular, um, the question of religion and secularism and the question of gender um, have become right after the departure of President Ben Ali a first order question. And um, in fact, that's not new. Uh, it was a first order question before. And in fact, it's coming back as, as a first order question with uh, concepts uh, that are structured in continuity with the past. And um, I'd like to go back to this idea of state feminism and the feminization of authoritarianism, which I find extremely compelling if they are combined uh, to one another. Um, yes, I think there is a feminization of authoritarianism, and um, there is uh, one image that really illustrates that feminization. It's the uh, negative image of the wives um, of the presidents. Um, and as you know, the president's, um, President Ben Ali's wife, for instance, has really become this uh, new Arab Marie Antoinette. Um, it is quite interesting that it is, in fact, uh, the image, the icon of a woman that has ended up representing authoritarianism. And I think um, this is an interesting um, image uh, that has emerged. Uh, and it has, in fact, many repercussions. Uh, there is another... Um, idea that was in fact articulated this idea this morning, sorry, um, by Shahira Amin. Um, she said, girls are the red line. Um, and uh, it strikes me that this is in fact an expression that has been often used also by uh, state feminism. And um, there might be, in fact, if we're dealing with images and representation, a lot to say about women being a red line. What type of line is it? Uh, why red? Uh, and what does it um, really, what type of obstacle is it and to what? And the question maybe we can think about is um, who draws the line? And um, how are women framed, uh, if I can use um, that term, which was inspired to me uh, by one of our uh, panelists' uh, title. So um, without taking more time, um, I'd like to introduce the, um, the panelists for um, this um, late afternoon. Uh, Dalanda Largesh will talk to us about religious discussions and women's challenges in Tunisia post-revolution. Then uh, Beth Barron will uh, talk to us about clusters of images and gendered discourses in Egypt. And finally, Elzbieta Matinia uh, will uh, talk about leaving the frame revolution and its discontents um, in um, post-communist um, Eastern Europe. Thank you. First, uh, I should thank the organizer for this wonderful conference. As Malika says, uh, I will try to present some reflections and information on religious discourses and women's challenges in Tunisia post-revolution. As it is uh, well now, now, less than 30 days changed Tunisia's history. Bouazizi's self-immolation in Sidi Bouzid on December 70, 2010, quickly spread the tsunami wave of the revolt, flooding 
numerous Tunisian regions and towns to finally result in the decline of one of the Arab world's most pernicious dictatorship on January 14th, 11th. Revolution the Tunisian people invented their proper revolution, a peaceful revolution in spring colors, a revolution for the ideals of freedom, dignity, and justice. No one can doubt in the role played by women in this revolution, women was said side by side with men were a compitious force when Tunisians took to the streets in the, in the January 11th to oust former President Zin al-Abdin Ben Ali. The first gains registered by women in the democratic transition process was the adoption in April 11 of a gender parity law, requiring equal numbers of women and men as candidates in the National Constituent Assembly election. The achievement of gender parity is an irreversible gain and a tangible reality in Tunisian politics, even if the number of women as a head of list was very limited in comparison to men. Strongly committed to democracy, the Tunisians rushed to vote with a remarkable degree of civic mindedness they bent to the election results, even though many of them were worrying about the tomorrow. The revolution certainly brought freedom of expression, opened up spaces, broke all form of oppression, and gave hope for democracy. The transparent election of October 23 are the best example of such ideals. It is not difficult to understand the Islamists' victory of the elections in a revolutionary context without leaders where another party, despite its long period of absence, was the only political force well-structured and deeply entrenched into society. It needs to be noted that it brought back into the focus of debate the eternal issue of identity and modernity in the Muslim context, especially the issue of women and gender equality. The rise of political Islam has clearly rolled back women's rights and their status, even in Tunisia, the Arab Muslim country well known by his secular legislation. Besides the ingenious political mechanism of the another party, the electoral test also reveals that a traditional social and religious structure still has an incontestable place in the social and cultural configuration of the global Tunisian society. The veil, the niqab, and other issues, such as polygamy, segregation between women and men, were openly discussed in Tunisia, especially by the Salafist movement. With perfect activism, this radical Islamist group bypasses 
the mainstream press and harness social media to bring its message to the masses against democracy and women's rights using mosques, demonstrations, and so on. Their daily harassment becomes increasingly visible, even if the followers are still minority. Women's rights are obviously constrained once again by political balances, especially when it comes to the movements that adopt political Islam as a reference. Thus, everything is becoming uncertain, unlikely, and ambiguous. The silence of the government directed by the Islamist party, another, regarding acts of violence, especially against women, against freedom, their clothing, and their way of life, even reinforces that impression. It's no longer difficult to demonstrate that the revolution of January that put an end to Ben Ali's regime was in fact only a political uprising. The elections opened the way for a second revolution, a cultural revolution with the society being the leading player for the first time in its history after having been kept away from the process undertaken by the totalitarian state in such context. Will an open-minded and up-to-date Tunisia, a Tunisia of modernity, emancipated women and secularism is able to defend the Tunisian exception against rising conservatism and regression, the social disparities, the increasingly deep gap between two societies, the weakness of the progressive democratic political power movement and its fractionalization are hardly likely to facilitate the task of constructing a real democracy and truly approaching a free and modern society. But one fact is certain, is merely the Tunisian women with all that she occupies as a reversible position in the social and economic development is an essential guarantee in this battle of democracy. The new future of the Tunisian revolution engraved in the political and public space is the civil society's power and the creation of a real counterpower where women are acting more and more. There is no better example for this than its echoes throughout the continuing street protesters, especially those across Habib Bourguib Avenue or in front of the Badu Palace, demanding to not touch to individual freedom and women's right. For or, for or against the inclusion of Sharia as a source of legislation in the new constitution, this is the main issue in Tunisia a few months ago. A society in which the question of women's status has a special place emerging under other political and ideological spectra. March 8. Uh, 12, the International Women's Day was celebrated this year on a background of an unusual cleavage in the history of the contemporary Tunisia. The Tunisian identity is played between two poles that have not yet found a common lexicon, 
The personal status code is the real Tunisian women's constitution, while the Sharia is a nostalgic request of some social groups. Indeed, the, the misunderstanding is heavy and concerns are so deep. Modernist elite, elites in the front lines, there were women who conducted a huge outreach campaign relayed by representatives of democratic and liberal parties acting within the assembly but where also another supporters played some role among secular parties. On March 25, a victory has just been achieved when the head of another announced that his party is a proponent to keep Article 1st of the Constitution of 1959, affirming that Islam is the official religion of the Tunisian state and thus decided to not include the principle of the Sharia ah as the main source of Tunisian legislation in the Constitution. The question now is, is it a tactic from al nahda or is it a response to the society's demand? The victory of the modernity bloc and the civil state future lagging a new challenge for the civil and political society at large within a framework tainted by the weakness of the state and the eruption of the conservative ideological currents adopted by youth excluded and marginalized for a long time. So far, the national state nurtured by a reformist and liberal ideology was the main guarantor of women's rights but today, nothing is definitely accurate. But what is sure today is that in the very heart of society is played most of the future of civil, social, and political rights of Tunisian women. It is mainly women who are bearing the, this fight. Even if all the urban middle class remains firmly in favor of keeping the social model built after independence. I, uh, I too would like to thank the organizers, the speakers, the, uh, the audience for hanging in the whole day, friends, and even a, a former teacher who's here. Um, I've learned so much today, so I really appreciate uh, being included. Um, you will hear echoes in uh, uh, previous presentations in my talk. Um, Egyptian. Egyptians of all backgrounds took to the streets in January 2011 to topple an authoritarian president. A year later, with the outcome of the revolution still unclear, Egyptians are debating who has the right to define, defend, and narrate the revolution. Should the focus be on the 18 days in Tahrir that toppled Mubarak, or on the labor strife leading up to it, or on its aftermath? Whose revolution is or was it anyway, youth, workers, women, ultras, the soccer players, or soccer fans, the Muslim brothers, all of the above, as there's obviously uh, overlap, uh, none of the above. Who but the martyrs can really speak for the revolution? But how can they talk? In a revolutionary act, the historian Khaled Fahmi is leading a team of volunteers that is documenting the January 25th revolution, archiving material at the same time that they are challenging how histories are written attempting to liberate history from the hold of the state. As a historian, I am most comfortable speaking from the distance of time and space, of time passed in a comfortable space, working with documents in written, oral, or visual text. And I'm now uh, trying to complete a book on the 1930s, which looks at the early Muslim Brotherhood, amongst other things. Um, it seems too soon to analyze and theorize, but observations can offer insights into, into the gendering of the revolution start with problems of representations. In the Egyptian revolution of March 1919, when few had cameras or codecs as they were called, the images of the revolution were limited. That those, uh, those that became iconic were often not even the ones that had come out of contemporary events themselves. 
They were taken later and thrust back in time, in large part because they seemed to capture those heady days better than the few images that actually existed. Unlike today, when images can be transmitted instantly around the world, reaching millions, it took days or weeks for an image to literally reach viewers in other shores. So one of the most iconic images of the 1919 revolution, this, this image is often associated with it, um, you see the women surging forward in unison a street rally, was actually snapped two years later in Alexandria. So it didn't even come out of Cairo. Um, uh, fast forward 90 years to January 2011, and Im images proliferate. Indeed, the multiplication of images speaks to the breadth of the revolution. It is no longer the prerogative of the photojournalist alone to record pivotal pictures. Every cell phone has the potential to capture an image. Every internet user the ability to upload it. Facebook pages propelled youth in onto the streets to topple the regime, and Facebook pages memorialize those who died. Nor are photographs or videos posted to YouTube, such, a, uh, such as uh, Asma Mahfouz's famous call to take to the streets on January 25th, the only representations. Street art proliferates too, with Murray's and graffiti taking over spaces. Uh, and here's an illustration. So which images are the most iconic? Those that are uh, most accessible and have reached an international audience or ones with local resonance? Which images carry the most meaning, and who ascribes that meaning? And how do we deal with contested images and claims that they have been doctored, taken out of context, or sensationalized for local consumption or the foreign media? So I go back in time again. One of the most pr prominent photos from 1919 of a young woman holding an Egyptian flag had been cropped out of a much more mundane image of a family in a carriage. These are methodological problems which may take time to resolve, but are worth considering. One of the most powerful sets of images to emerge out of the recent revolution in Egypt has been that of mothers of the martyrs, such as the mother of Khaled Said, the young Alexandrian man beaten to death by police in June 2010, whose Facebook page, We Are All Khaled Said, rallied Egyptians to stand up against torture. Uh, she, uh, she, she appeared at numerous protest events. Oddly enough, the Muslim brothers have not celebrated their martyrs or the mothers of their martyrs to the same extent that other political, group, political groupings have, in part to avoid radicalizing the revolution. Oddly also, fathers of the martyrs have not been celebrated. Indeed, they have been absent. Is this because Hosni Mubarak claimed to speak as the father of the Egyptians? or that focusing on fathers accentuates their inability to protect the young and therefore uh, emas uh, emasculates them. Then there are the martyrs themselves. Women have been among their ranks and have been memorialized. The first female martyr, Sally Zahran, uh, who's been called the Egyptian Joan of Arc, was in her 20s, uh, a flower of youth. She's also, uh, this is a, a kind of a banner that appeared, in um, one of the marches. She's also memorialized in a Facebook page. Another set of images and discourses focuses on those who have been uh, deflowered or subjected to sexual violence, and we've heard quite about, a lot about that today. A group of 17 women protesting in March 2011 was arrested and subjected to forced virginity tests at the police station in front of soldiers some of whom took, apparently took pictures. Samira Ibrahim refused to remain silent and filed lawsuits against the military and the doctor who performed the test. She claimed the mantle of the nation and used the language of honor, even, um, even as the doctor was acquitted of the charges. She, she uh, apparently said, nobody violated my honor, it's Egypt whose honor was violated, and I will go on to the end to get her rights. This trope, Egypt as a woman, whose honor needed protecting, arose in the late 19th century as Egyptians tried to wrest control of the state from the British occupation. But now both the female pro pro protesters and the Egyptian military regime made competing claims to embody, defend the honor of the nation. Ibrahim's, uh, Samir Ibrahim's challenging of the right of the state to police women's body is an enormous step as she broke through a barrier of fear. 
It is in this context that one should view the powerful image of the woman violently beaten in Tahrir Square uh, and stripped down to, uh, to her jeans and blue bra on December 18, 2011. The picture of the Tahrir girl is one of the most disturbing images of the Egyptian counter-revolution, the pushback by the military to emerge. Uh, the, the brutal savagery of the soldiers who, who disrobed and stomped upon her chest, and there's a, obviously a video version of this, um, give lie to any claim that the state may have that it was protecting the honor of women, and therefore of Egypt. Rather, violence against women has been taken as a sign that there are no lines, red or otherwise, that the army would not cross to hold on to power. That the name, age, face, and fate of this female protester initially remained unknown makes this graphic image even more powerful. She stands for every woman or man who is vulnerable to the power of the state. Um, the numerous images supporting the Tahrir woman, as she's called, emerged, um, one of which I show here, and there are other artistic renderings, um, with, her, with the blue bra displacing the eagle and the Egyptian flag. This brings us to the question of absent images. What about the women um, of the Muslim Brotherhood who chose not to march with the thousands of women who rallied, rallied after the image of the uh, Tahrir woman was broadcast so broadly? And what sorts of representations of and by the Muslim Brotherhood, um, other than men with beards, have emerged? What does their seemingly dis seeming disinterest in visual representation tell us about the Muslim Brotherhood? Some final thoughts. A revolution disrupts time, inverts it, breaking with the past, creating a new present, and permitting a reimagining of the future. Egyptians battled in January 2011 and have continued to battle over the national patrimony. How will they create a better world for their children so that the latter can reach their potentials? It was, after all, a youth revolution waged by and ostensibly for the young. In, uh, in this light, the street murals that have been painted on the walls uh, the Egyptian military erected in the streets surrounding Tahrir to stop large numbers of Egyptians from marching on the interior ministry are telling. Artists have, artists have used sorry, artists have used this space collaboratively to create impromptu public art. Two images are particularly striking. One, this one's actually called Tomorrow, shows a man handing a young girl a balloon under a rainbow, as you see. A second depicts a man holding the hand of a young boy as they walk off into the distance in the future. It may not be only the Muslim Brotherhood who have written women out of public space, out of their futures. Um, some leftist artists may also have done the same, empowering men to take control of the care of the next generation. One of the conclusions that I reached in writing the book, Egypt as a Woman, which dealt with uh, events around the 1919 revolution, is that it is not enough for women to make history, to march in revolutions, they must write and record it. In this case, in looking at women making democracy, um, a similar principle may hold. Women took to the streets in record numbers in January 2011, helping deliver parliamentary democracy to Egypt, and yet they have been pushed to the side or underfoot in the aftermath. Uh, it's important for them to shape their own images and representations, to, to insert themselves into the narrative, preserve their memories, and inscribe their dreams of the future, whatever, whatever political positions they may espouse. Thank you. Our Arab Spring uh, took place, depending how you count, either started in 1980, in August 1980, uh, that was in Poland, or in 1989 in, the, in Eastern Central Europe. So I'm here either as a 32 or 23, depending how you want. But whether I'm young or old, I'm not here to advise. I really am I'm here to, to, to learn, and I learned a lot, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I've been wondering to what extent um, the situation of women in Eastern Europe before and during um, the transition from the communist regime to democracy and that of uh, women in Arab Spring are similar. And the first thing that comes to mind is that in most of those countries, whether Poland, Tunisia, or Egypt. Um, even though women were very active in movements for democracy, the gender was not on the radar of those movements. And of course, we discuss that all the time. Um, I also think that feminism, full-fledged feminism, was largely impossible or unthinkable 
it was un, uh, unthinkable in Poland, and I think it was largely for cultural and political reasons to uh, different extents impossible in, um, in various Arab countries. Or I took a closer look at the situation in Poland 20 years ago. It was uh, just two years after the collapse of Berlin Wall. I went there. Um, I realized, um, I, I saw various paradoxes, and one which, which very, was very striking is that, in fact, the only sphere of freedom that we had in Eastern Europe prior to the collapse of communism, that one which was actually in Poland offered by the church, had uh, not only disappeared, but turned out to be a strain of const constraint for women. And that's what I want to talk today about. Uh, Poland's situation was rather uh, exceptional, actually, in the region. Um, uh, it was uh, the one country in the, among the communist bloc uh, in which uh, uh, the church, Catholic church, the repressed, was strong, or should I say was, was still there, that, and the churches were full. The very vulnerable position of the church vis-a-vis -vis the uh, communist regime um, uh, afforded the church a very strong position vis-a-vis -vis society. And uh, vis-a-vis Polish society, and the high moral authority of the church already identified a century ago, in 19th century, um, with the patriotic struggle for the independence from imperial powers, uh, was further strengthened in 1970, 100 years later, um, when the church provided a safe space for many underground activities and thus became identified with the struggle for democracy. Um, I feel a bit squeamish speaking here. Uh, I remember how annoyed we were initially uh, when some Western feminists who thought they knew best what has to be done in Poland came. Um, um, because they knew, but because they've been through this already. So let me just say this, that the situation of women in Eastern Europe, or more specifically in Poland, and, uh, and, and, and that um, uh, it was and is different from the situation of women both in the established democracies of the West and in the, uh, uh, in, in the movements of the Arab Spring that aspire to democracy. But there is also a lot of similar, similar things. I'm, I'm uh, thinking, for example, about the 16 months uh, of freedom during uh, uh, Poland's solidarity, so-called solidarity period, solidarity revolution in 1980 to 1981, 16 months, when democratic aspirations uh, were first articulated in public. One of the most um, exhilarating aspects of this solidarity revolution was the sense we all had in making of, of making democracy together with men. And we heard it so many times today, but I'm going to repeat it because we have to know, it's not just your unique experience, uh, we, uh, of being in it together. In, in, in such a situation, the voicing of, um, of any need for gender equality at the time, um, in a new society that we were all fighting for, seemed completely redundant, out of place. Democracy first. Um, thrilled uh, by the events that we were co-creating, we had no idea. We had no idea that the new democracy might be one without women. Uh, and now when I read various blogs uh, by women from um, Arab countries, from Egypt actually, I see unmistakably uh, similar expectations. The solidarity movement, the solidarity revolution which ultimately brought down the um, uh, authoritarian systems in the entire region, in Central Europe, actually began with a woman. Uh, in the Gdańsk shipyard on, uh, in August uh, 1980, a 50-year-old crane operator named Anna Valentinovich, you have her there, um, highly respected for her relentless work ethic and uh, also for the fact that she was a member, an active member of the Underground uh, Labour Union, uh, was fired. The entire shipyard went on strike, 20,000 men, occupational strike, mostly men. Um, and the authorities got scared. And a few days later, they promised to rehire Valentinovich and to increase, give a small increase of the wages. Now, here is this image of Valentinovich that is soon to be known as the mother courage of the uh, Gdańsk strike. Strikes. With the regime concessions, the first strike in communist Poland agreed, uh, appeared to have ended quickly, but Valentinovich and two other women, each at the different uh, exit gates, stopped their male colleagues from leaving the shipyard, arguing people who supported us are imprisoned. There are many political prisoners in Poland. We cannot go home. And this is how the struggle for democracy uh, in Poland began. Now, 
even if the thrill of a peaceful revolution may be much the same everywhere. All of us acting as if we were born free and equal in dignity and rights, no two revolutions, no two revolutions or democratic transformations are ever the same, are ever alike. Our lives are framed by uh, sets of specific sociocultural practices which have evolved according to their own historically and culturally flamed, framed logic in which people often think only they, we, can know so intimately what it is about. And indeed, um, it is because of this cultural cloak or veil that we think others uh, cannot properly understand us. I'm convinced that culturalism is a powerful force everywhere. Um, but that um, our intimate knowledge of our own cultural idioms opens up for us, as women, a, change, a chance to engage with them, to make their opacity visible, and to reveal their confining qualities. In other words, post-revolutionary transformations offer an opportunity to dismantle the cultural paradigms that have constrained women, and women ought to seize it. Let me show some images to help us understand the incredible hurdles that women face in their respective culture. They are, those are constructed hurdles, cultural hurdles, with religion being a part of it. And the enduring power of these images, whether displayed visual, uh, visually as icons or narrated over generations, over time, had the capacity to silence women, uh, to silence women actors, or to reinterpret their action and to present the mom moments of revolutions as fleeting exceptions in otherwise male-dominated public space. Here is the famous Black Madonna, an image that conveys to Paul a powerfully patriotic or perhaps matriotic message. A specifically Polish religiosity centers on the cult of Madonna. She is our mother. She is our queen. She's the queen of Poland. Uh, always suffering quietly with the nation, a tear running down her cheek, the Virgin Mary, never pregnant, usually with a baby in her arms. Though uh, its iconography festivals, through the iconography festivals and pilgrimages, this folk religiosity glorifies. <laughs> okay, very quickly, this folk religiosity glorifies the heroic self-sacrificing women and mother. This is how the Virgin Mary, was defiantly celebrated precisely during the communist times. But when the communist regime decided the cult of the Virgin Mary was getting out of hand, um, it forbade its, uh, this peregrination of the icon. And since the image was forbidden, people began to carry empty frames, vividly displaying in public the silencing of the, of the society. Perversely, though, it was also a serviceable image of a silenced woman. She has disappeared. She's not there. But the memory of her image reinforces the struggle against the regime. Images are indeed very helpful in deciphering and diagnosing the situation of women as framed by cultural expectations that are frozen and fixed by traditions. Those expectations loosen their grip on us during exceptional momentous events, but then quickly and often more powerfully reemerge to proclaim symbolically, but perversely, our allegedly central and even public place in society. One of our lessons in Central Europe, somebody asked for lessons, <laughs> lessons um, is to look back and identify the sources of the oblique cultural subjugation of women, scrutinize the images, dismantle them, and then disempower those images that are the backbone of cultures, which officially, while officially glorifying women, render them rightless and abused on earth. Here are some examples of such a dismantling. This is in a monument in Luxembourg. The Nike goddess. <laughs> erected to celebrate victory after World War I and known as a Golden Lady of Luxembourg. A Croatian artist, friend, Sanja Ivekovic, invited to take part in the renowned Manifesta European Biennial of Contemporary Art, proposed that the Golden Lady be removed from its pedestal and taken temporarily to the women's shelter. Shelter for abused women. And denied the permission, she came uh, up a few days later with an alternative Golden Lady ex uh, erected nearby, which she called the Lady Rosa of Luxembourg. It is almost exact replica of Golden Lady, except this one is pregnant. The first one is in the MoMA recent exhibit, the, one, the other one is actually displayed as displayed. You can see it in Luxembourg. 
And though everybody knew that the pregnant woman was there to, drama to dramatize the use of rape as a weapon in the war in, uh, in, the war of, uh, in Bosnia, this intervention with those the inscriptions on the base like slut and whore caused a huge controversy in Luxembourg and throughout the Europe. Do you remember the TV image? Of course you remember the TV image uh, of the young women. I'm not going to talk about it at all, and I didn't intend it, but I wanted to tell you that this is what our, the lady of Luxembourg is, a blue bra girl, who the soldier said was just asking for it. Pedestals and idolizing imagery are women's hurdles to democracy. They remove us from and keep us above public life. We are not part of the street. We are not part of the public square. And even if we um, appear to be, we do not appear. We are not to be seen. Various cultural devices make us um, invisible as persons. We do not share any Arendtian space of appearance, a necessary site for the inclusion and dialogue that constitute democratic culture. If you are on a pedestal, or in an idolized painting that's frozen in time, or on a pinup for that matter, you are not part of the public square, even if, public space, even if you were once a part of the Tahiri Square or at the gates of Gdańsk shipyard activating change. This woman on the pedestal is not you. It's an image that's policing you. Well, getting rid of dictatorship does not mean arriving to democracy. We talked about it. Formal democracy is not yet democracy. Free elections and even civil society is not enough. Here in a, is a thesis that's clearly counterintuitive. When it comes to women, moments of revolution, moments on the square, are indeed moments of public happiness. But paradoxically, recent revolutions have turned uh, out reactionary as they restored the old gender order. In April 1989, one minute please, um, the most sizable uh, uh, Polish solidarity, the most sizable uh, uh, movement ever in this part of the world, three, one million, uh, 10 million registered members, uh, then negotiated a peaceful dismantling of the communist system and the right to your first free or almost free elections. Since the citizenry still had no access to the media, which were all government owned, solidarity came up with, the compelling, with a compelling poster mobilizing society to take part in the upcoming elections on June 4th. You remember? No, you don't. <laughs> um, maybe you know this person there. Gary Cooper in high noon, walking alone to his final confrontation with the outlaws. The pistol in his hand had been airbrushed out and uh, replaced with the paper ballot. And above, the sheriff's star on his chest is that he wears this famous Solidarity logo. The caption um, below reads, high noon, the 4th of June, 1989. Well, whether he was a Solidarity bracing to clean up the place or a citizen heading for the voting booth, it was the most talked about image of the campaign. Everybody reveled on how well it captured what people felt at the time. Dramatic tensions, affirmation of justice, a sense of agency, and the assurance of a successful performance. The message was right on target. But only from the perspective of time, it reveals a peculiar trait of the democratic transformation project, its maleness. Unlike the gendered image of the nation, we talked about it here, which had always been female, and the image of the newly institutionalized democratic polity in Poland, the source of societal hope at the end of the 12th, 20th century, emerged brazenly male. And at that time, nobody, clearly not Polish women, seemed alarmed or even aware of being excluded, but a pathetic case of false consciousness, one would say. A per so we have learned to pay attention to images to intervene in them, to be aware of the differences between the pedestal representation of a given cultural community and the reality of its practices. It took time, but women in Eastern Europe, and I'm talked about it, have learned the strat how strategic they have to be in safeguarding their place in the public space, public, not symbolic, space in the offices of the newly democratic state, not in the empty frames. Indeed, they have to think how to occupy such a space, and um, it is just half a minute, and in such a way, I have to finish, uh, because there is a, there is a, there is a, yeah. And, it, uh, and in such a way that it cannot be um, taken away from them, and they cannot be squeezed out of it. Uh, there is this picture from Manifa. Manifa is from Manifestation, a, a, a popular carnavalesque women's solidarity march that has been taking place in Polish cities every March since 1997. I won't comment on this picture and a coincidence of the blue bra in this image. It was taken in, in March. There is no image. Uh, it was taken in March um, 2011, so before, before what happened, uh, what, we, what we saw in that brutal uh, beating of the woman in, um, in uh, Cairo. 
And, and take a look at this poster of Manifa, for Manifa, a perfect counterpoint to the Gary Cooper poster inviting people to join the Manifa, where the most persistent theme in a country that criminalizes abortion is women's reproductive rights. The poster reads, March 8th, high noon. There is a lot here to, uh, to discuss uh, the question of um, images in relationship to uh, timelines, uh, images that help uh, inscribe revolutions, uh, write revolution, record, remember, but also probably forget, uh, forget what is supposedly not important at a certain time when um, the moment of a fugitive democracy uh, to reappropriate a, uh, a term by uh, Sheldon Wallin, this moment where fugitive democracy makes all the uh, fragmented politics uh, go away. Um, so that was a very interesting um, a panel, very rich panel, and I hope we can uh, keep uh, in mind those uh, questions of um, images, inscriptions, remembering and forgetting um, in the questions um, and answers um, that will follow. So I'd like to um, uh, open up uh, the panelists uh, first um, for questions and then the floor. Um, thank you very much. I had uh, quite just one observation. Um, Beth, I think you said, but perhaps I misunderstood that the, the Muslim Brotherhood had no images, because I, I don't think that's strictly true. It might be true for the older generation, but I don't think it's true for the younger generation. I mean, I don't know if it counts as images, but a friend of mine from the younger Brotherhood started to rear TV station, so that was a whole lot of images, you know, every day. But I'll, I'll let you answer that in a second. That was my main, my main question was, I was so shocked on my last trip to Cairo in a conversation with someone who is very liberal, a businessman, now working in the uh, government, but a businessman, very liberal person, who in response to the blue bra incident said to me, well, but you know, you know what they were doing to agitate the soldiers. You know how they were agitating the soldiers. And I said, are you kidding? I mean, we really had this like big argument and I was so shocked. It's one thing from a religious extremist. This was coming from a very moderate individual and there seems to have been, maybe you can answer this, have a whole narrative constructed around this image. And I don't know if it was because the image was so shocking and people had to somehow make something up, but I just couldn't believe it. And so I wonder if any of you have encountered that and can explain it. And if not you, maybe you can. I don't know. I was so horrified. Can I say something? I know that I'm, I shouldn't say anything about that, but I actually tried to study it, and I met with a, um, a friend who's a journalist in Egypt, and her, her group took that person, that, um, that picture, not the video, but they uh, published the picture, and she did tell me that they were very careful with airbrushing all characteristics. So the, the woman had a very characteristic bag and also a scarf that she could be easily recognized by. So they were they took because because of the accusations that that indeed she was asking for it. That, that, that those women are asking for it. You know what they are doing there. Uh, I don't have a question, but. Uh, a statement to make uh, concerning Egypt. Uh, the Egyptian society began so early in history and women were working with men on the fields on equal terms. There was no differentiation between men and women. And at that time, several women rose to be heads of state, like Nefertiti, Cleopatra, and so on. Then we moved to the Middle Ages, where, uh, and the Memluk period. Do you, do you have a question uh, for, I appreciate very much that you want to develop a certain point, but do you have a question? Yes, I will end up with a question. Thank you. 
Okay? Uh, two or three women rose again to be heads of state. And that was the Middle Ages when Europe and all over the world did not, part women did not participate in politics at all. To the modern time, Egyptian women rose to the top several times and even at the present time, women being ministers and in very distinguished position in politics and in the administration. And lastly, women are doing uh, their role in Egypt and also in the Arab world. And let me say this, Islam uh, started with women uh, with the person who brought up Muhammad the prophet. She was Khadija, and she was a businesswoman who brought him up, and she was the first to believe in Islam. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next question now. Yes. Uh, this question emerges from Elspieta's, uh really interesting. I want to go back and watch the video so I can pick up all the details that you were going through very quickly. Um, so this is intended to be, a, again, a provocative question. It's the end of the day. Uh, it, if I understood what you were saying, it was that sort of like in Arab Spring, in its various countries' incarnations, women in Poland started with, this is about democracy. This isn't about gender. This isn't about feminism. Things are going to be okay. We're together with men. We're united. This is about democracy. And then they more or less got betrayed. I, I, my word, not yours, but, but, but something pretty close. Sounds like we've heard more or less the same story from not all, but many of the countries that were involved in what we're calling Arab Spring. Again, my word betrayed, not. But so, so what's going on here, right? I mean, is it that women are sort of naive and they keep having to learn the same lesson over and over and they'll never get it, right? I mean, we'll have the next 20 or 30 or 50 years from now, the next revolutionary effort, which is gonna produce the same cycle. That's one version of the question. How do we explain this? And another version is that this is a perfectly sensible, correct, strategic choice. Focus and unification with the men, get democracy going, and then later think about issues of gender or feminism or rights. How do we break this cycle? Who would like to take up the question? The three of you, maybe. <laughs> <It's totally unfair. laughs> yeah. Let me take a few questions. No, it, 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 yes. it isn't a question, but yes, uh, I think that um, many uh, cases or experience in history show us that uh, the, the same phenomena is uh, producing. And maybe when uh, we, uh, we, we take the, the, um, the case of Tunisia, it's really, um, it's a case very interesting because after all of these uh, more than 60 years, and uh, the, the same question is uh, becoming on the surface, then we have uh, to think about, maybe it's, it has a link in, with the mentalities, of course, the patriar patri patriarchy, <laughs> yes, it's still here, and yes, we have to, to learn more and more, but, I don't know. I, I think there is something. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's, a, um, there's two points, I think. One is there's a danger that there's, like, uh, uh, there's only one road to modernity and there's only one road to democracy. I mean, I think that we have to take each case separately. And, and in fact, um, I mean, I think some of what we've heard today is that, you know, whereas the, gen the meta narrative may be, oh my goodness, you know, it, we've taken one step forward, five steps back. But actually, if you look at the case of Egypt, the case of Tunisia, there are there are a lot of gains on the ground, and you have to look at the specific details of what's happening. Um, I mean, it, it, uh, I mean, on the surface, it looks like you know the, the, uh, that that there have been a lot of losses, but on the other hand, barriers of fear have been completely broken, uh, broken down. So I, I think you have to contextualize each case differently and look at the specifics. Otherwise, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm a historian, we look at the specific cases. Otherwise, we're gonna end up with, it's, we have to go down the same road, and I think that you know, historians and others have, have said that's, that's not the way that we should be analyzing these uh, events. I do think that there is something to, uh, that one can actually kind of zero on uh, uh, in there. And one thing that I think is very, very important that all those events, um, and those art events, and, and, and which change, which really uh, 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 shift us somewhere else, send us somewhere else, and uh, take down or, uh, or erase or dismantle the barrier of fear. The other thing that happens, which is closely related to that, is that what I call public happiness. You know, it's that, that kind of experience that it's, impossible, uh, uh, it was impossible, and in fact it is impossible outside of those, of, of those moments. And because of this of, of incredible depth of that, and the joy which comes with the fact of being there together and being able to communicate, to see others, others can see, you, you know, people that you never saw, and it's so many of us, and Mubarak is there alone. I, you know, I mean, that, that the kind of realization that is have very difficult to theorize, but I think one, one I, I'm thinking a little bit about public happiness, but I didn't go much far with it. But I think there is something, it's difficult to give up. It's difficult to give up, and it's difficult to, believe, to, to, to lose your faith that after that extraordinary transformation, which is a social but also individual transformation, by the way, I think that those revolutions are also different because they are not about masses. People are there kind of individually, you know, and, and, and I think that that makes it different from the revolutions of 19th century, not only because they are nonviolent, so I think after that, it's very difficult to, to believe that, uh, excuse me, so now we are redundant, we, um, we are not necessary anymore, we can go home. Uh, I think it's difficult because of the, of, the, of the quality of what had happened, but it's difficult to describe, okay. If I can just add something to that, I think um, the moment that comes after this exceptional moment, the moment of transition very often is a moment of compromise. And um, the political, comp the, the constellation of compromises that are made on a day-to-day -day basis made political actors think about the revolution as something past, and therefore that, you know, those compromises needed to accept also certain things. For instance, for the Islamists would be, well, let's abandon Sharia in the constitution in Tunisia. But for the feminists, it's also, well, let's accept that we won't change the, um, the law on inheritance, which is still Islamic, right? So when you look at the Tunisian compromise that's being built today, what you see is a status quo, in fact, transition, because everybody's compromising and the past is replicated in the name of that revolution that has to work, which is quite ironic in the end. So it's quite, a, I'm offering a pessimistic interpretation. Yeah, but that's tentative, temporarily. Actually, uh, I wanted to also contribute to this discussion. Um, for me, there are two points, I mean, in addition to what has already been mentioned. One is that, so theoretically, I think for me, I mean, there are these age-long, I mean, for decades, feminist scholars have discussed the relationship between feminism and nationalism. And I think this debate is so vivid now, and I think that, I mean, in the past, you know, I think we were often too, or at least sort of Western liberal scholars, feminist scholars were um, too harsh in their sort of uh, categorical <clears throat> rejection of nationalism or nationalism is something that's definitely bad for women. And I mean, although I still feel there is, it's very problematic, but I think we have to look, you know, in very specific contexts that nationalism is important, especially in sort of freedom, anti-colonial, anti-occupation struggles. We can't just dismiss it. That would be one um, angle. The other point is, I think, you know, only a minority of women in any given context are feminist, okay? And so our political identities, of course, shift in different contexts. And I think I, I understand it very clearly why, you know, most Egyptian women initially did not come out in terms of, you know, their gender identity, but as citizens. But I think it's, um, I think it's also partly the failure of feminist movements in the West, across the region, in the Middle East, of failing to actually um, mobilize en masse. 
Um, and so I think that you know part of the part of the challenge for the future is to do that. And for me, one of the big points is, I mean, this whole dichotomy between secular and Islamic feminism or Islamist, I mean, to me, you know, these are often very unuseful dichotomies that actually gloss over the much more fluid um, political strategies and identities. And for me, I feel, you know, it's much more important whether someone is still reproducing political authoritarianism or actually trying to break that, whether by trying to reinterpret Islam or by using international conventions. And I think for me, that's one of the biggest failures of feminists, well, certainly in the context of Muslim countries, to not be able to work across these categories of secular, you know, Islamic feminist, Islamist feminism. And I, I understand that there are some boundaries where you can't work across, but I think there could be more attempts made. Yes, there is... Um, okay. Yeah, I Just to address Jennifer's question again, I could just address you directly, but I'll address you in public. Um, in answer to, to that, I see um, three factors. One is unity. Everybody realizes if you want to get something political done, and if it's a moment of great urgency, like bringing down a dictator, you've got to have unity. And any kind of diversion, like feminism, if, if that turns out to be a diversion rather than a part of the ongoing struggle, is going to be weaken the movement. And black, this is the thing that black feminists in the United States had to struggle with in the civil rights movement and, and after, you know, when the feminist movement came, that they were dividing the black struggle. And that was a very difficult problem for many African-American women. It wasn't just an easy thing at all. Unity is really critical. The second thing is youth. A large number of these movements are done, are really spearheaded, particularly in the streets, by young people. Well, young people don't know much about history. That's their beauty. They, they think they can do sorts of things which older people think they can't do. And that, but that also means that a lot of lessons learned in the past are, are, are not known by the youth. A third, uh, probably perhaps controversial issue, and maybe not in the slightest bit uh, relevant to the Mideast, but in, um, in uh, European countries, sexual attraction is an important part of left mo movements. People, people used to join the Communist Party so they could meet girls, and girls were often in the Communist Party so they could meet boys. But even if it's not so instrumental, part of that unity is a part of the joy, part of the sort of excitement of the movement is one that's to some degree mixed up with hormones. And this, I'm only saying, and this may have no relationship to what happened in the Middle East. It may only have to do with some of the other more European revolutions. But that's another reason why you don't want to sort of bring up feminism is because, <laughs> no, seriously, because uh, you're in, in, in close relationships with men. So now what lessons can we learn in fact, with the, those are some possible explanations. I don't think the lessons have to come from the explanations. Um, I think you can just draw lessons without... So these are the lessons I would learn. In those kinds of moments of urgency, don't make feminism a divisive issue, but do do this. Lay the seeds for the future by making the idea, linking the ideals of the revolution to the ideas, deals of gender equality. You can say things en route in the course of the revolution that lay those ideals. And I think, for example, in South Africa of the um, ANC, the women in the ANC, after a while, said, you know, exactly the same ideals that we've been fighting for, um, for blacks against whites, are the ideals that we can apply for women. And it was very difficult for the men, black and white, in the ANC, then to say, oh yes, these ideals apply to one struggle, but not to another. So those kinds of um, sort of bricks can begin to be laid, even in the moment of highest desire for unity. And then 
just to add to this conversation, and I guess my starting point was uh, uh, why uh, Nadja's about why why don't we make relations between Islamists and secularists about feminism. I think what we I guess we're leaving out here is that. Uh, in some degree, the Islamist movement was a, re a response to secularist oppression. Just as we we're leaving out, I think, also what was brought out, in, particularly in an earlier panel by Rima and others, that feminism was used as a stick to beat. Uh, the, so all of this is part of the picture. We can't kind of separate all this. So we, we, uh, somehow we have to remake that history before we can do it, or at least or spell it out or something. Otherwise, it's not so easy to, to, to look across without understanding that the very raison d'etre of the Islamist, rise of Islamism was to get rid of these oppressive so-called seculars, or what was done to them in the name of secularism. Thanks very much. I, I wanted to respond to Jennifer's question because I do think that it's not simply the case that we keep reinventing the same dilemmas, the same problems. Um, and I, while I think that there is um, each, each movement for democracy and each moment has its historical particularity, I think that there has been considerable learning um, and I think that one of the most central issues that at least across Africa we've learned, and I, I'm not sure that the conditions in North Africa are the same as the, the rest of sub-Saharan Africa, was the importance of, of creating a foundation in constitution and law. Um, and, and not saying that that will be worked out on the ground, because I think that the, that needs to be dealt with quite early on because that opening only exists for a, a brief moment. Constitutions don't constantly get remade. So even where, uh, in, in cases across Africa where there's, uh, for example, con there are constitutional norms that appear to be ahead of where if you took a democratic vote or a referendum, people might agree to, and there's nevertheless a value in pushing that. So I think the, the one thing that has been learned in many post-colonial countries is that democracy doesn't simply mean the rule of the majority. There are certain democratic norms and values, and it's important to get those uh, established. But at the same time, uh, I think what what I've learned from this panel and certainly learned across Africa is that if you don't have an idiom of democracy that reflects the society in which it is growing, then it's going to be rejected as an imported model. There is no blueprint. There are no, you know, there's no one path to modernity. Uh, and it's even questionable whether the kind of modernity that the West represents is, has worked for the West. Well, thank you. Uh, we're going to uh, open up um, to the questions to the floor, and uh, maybe we'll take um, several questions at the same time and then have the panel respond. Uh, please. Okay. My name is Fazia Ahmed, and um, I've heard a lot of talk today about, about using um, the, uh, the revolution as a window of opportunity to mainstream women, that means to uh, try and see if, uh, if the revolution and the push, the impetus uh, can lead to women in the council's key decision-making um, groups. Um, I think this is important, but as my research in Bangladesh shows, and as our South African sister spoke in the morning, uh, said in the morning, um, it's not enough to simply have women in key positions. The numbers game is not enough. Uh, changing the gender of governance doesn't necessarily lead to feminist governance. So I urge all scholars and activists to define what feminist governance is, to hold women uh, who do um, end up in positions of power and men as a result of uh, people like that young uh, woman, uh, you know, giving her life, uh, to hold uh, them accountable to feminist governance. So my question is, what do you define as feminist governance? 
Um, good afternoon. My name is Christine Ramirez. I'm from the United, uh, University of Rhode Island. And I have a few questions about the images, primarily for um, Elizabeth's uh, presentation. Um, I've noticed that um, we that there's more of a stance for images that are primarily, um, there's this undertone of victimization or struggle um, and the removal of the uh, Virgin Mary image um, didn't really portray that and I felt that um, should we stand behind certain images like that as opposed to um, images of the slight undertone because of the fact that, um, losing my thought, <laughs> um, but due to the fact that there's a cer certain backlash, are we like asking for the potential backlash by um, having images of women who are struggling, fighting? Um, so, yeah. Hi, Kimberly Manchester from the University of Rhode Island. Um, my curiosity is that my elders emigrated here from Poland and when the revolution came in the mid 80s, it was the talk of my family for years at every family gathering on a quite regular basis. So my curiosity is because I do know that it was almost a religious uprising by the people as opposed to the government and with the Polish Pope encouraging them to stand up. I guess I'm asking your opinion. Do you think that religion and democracy are two sides of the same rope tied into a Gordian knot, unable to be separated? Because I'm seeing what's happening in the Middle East and the citizens are trying to overthrow an Islamic government and they have the support of nations worldwide from the democratic end of things. So, thank you. Hello, my name is Nana Karpedia. Um, I have a question um, related to Iran and Iranian uprising, since we have not spoken a lot, much about it. The issues that even though there was no revolution result, there was a huge uprising, and women were very much involved from what we were seeing in the West. We had women up, um, even though it was not necessarily a very peaceful revolution, there were women who were actively involved, and similarly to Khalid Said, Iran ha had um, Neda Suleiman, who was the symbol of the uprising and women being a victim. So when we are talking about current situation and the past that in the Middle East and in the Arab countries mainly, women failed to be successfully represented in parliaments and politics, either because of the regime or because of the religion. And when we look into Iran, which is an Islamic Republic with necessarily not a very positive regime, how come somehow Iran, Iranian society somehow managed to still develop their civil so society in relation to women, but the Arab countries didn't really manage to, and are there deeper roots than just religion and regime that we are not looking into? Thanks. Hello, my name is Lisa Goldman. My question builds on your very interesting question. Sorry, I don't know your name. Um, I believe that in order for democracy to exist effectively in a society, the institutions that support democracy need to be built. Uh, courts, uh, et cetera. So my question for you is, if we want democratic societies in which women are have equal rights to men and are equally represented in the public square, given that there are differences between men and women and we need to acknowledge that they exist in the roles we play um, in our private lives. Um, what, what do you see countries doing to build the institutions that would support a democracy in which greater uh, equality would exist between men and women. If you think I'm correct that those institutions are necessary in order to have effective democracy, how do you see those institutions being built in various societies around the world? 
Well, thank you for all these questions. Um, should the panelists will respond one by one? We'll start with uh, Delenda. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> about the question or, or remark on uh, the weak position of women, if we take the example of Tunisia, which is the best example of uh, the state feminism, uh, it's true, even in Tunisia, uh, where women are very present and ve um, their participation in all levels of economic and social and cultural uh, uh, life, uh, uh, they still, they are accessibility to, to the high position is very weak, very weak. And not only in uh, the institution of state, even if we, t if we take um, the trade union, where 40% are women, we, we, we don't find uh, even on, on no, no one women in the direction. And in the uh, polit political party, in the direction, that it's a problem of a mentality. We, women are very present in the, uh, in the real life. And, but now, um, I'm really with the, um, the, the, the question of quota is very important. And uh, it, it is uh, because it, it, it's helping women to, to be in the post of decision. And I think that the, what uh, Tunisia was experimenting uh, with um, uh, the last uh, decision is very, uh, is very important. And, but women are now, I mean, Tunisians are very, uh, very uh, conscious with, with this problem, and they are acting on that level. Uh, once about the um, is, are we in front of a revolution or no? Uh, I think I'm angry that the moment is uprising at the moment. I, I take the case Tunisian case and. I think uh, the other case also. Um, in Tunisia, the, the regime is changed, but the real revolution, we are living it now. It's a process, it's an action. Uh, the process, and we don't know how, how can, uh, we are acting every day of, uh, uh, of this. Um, I couldn't say it's really a revolution, but what a revolution is not only one day or one week, it's a process. We don't know what time it will, it will take. That's all. Um, uh, just to respond to some of the uh, questions maybe. Um, backwards. The, the question of the institutions that support democracy, I think it's a, an issue of building institutions, but also as well as dismantling institutions. And start, you have to look at the Egyptian military, which is a military that's been more supported by U.S. dollars for many years. Um, so, it's, so that whole institution needs to be uh, kind of pushed back, as it were. Um, the, the question uh, that was raised earlier on about the sort of the surprise that a liberal would um, kind of uh, feel that the blue bra girl, the girl with the blue bra, or she's also called the Tahrir girl, had asked for it. I think we're surprised when it's a liberal. We're not surprised, or we think that we wouldn't be surprised if it was um, someone from another sector. Um, but I, but I, I think the issue is that we really have to be uh, aware that. Um, it's not just a Muslim Brotherhood that may be pushing back against women, it's all sorts of groups that are. Um, and, and sort of looking at that in reverse, um, and building on um, uh, uh, the point Nadia made earlier, it, uh, I think it's really important to, um, to look to the Muslim Brotherhood and, and, and recognize that groups like the, the Muslim Sisters at, at times have been far more numerous than groups of feminists. Um, historically. So it's really important to try to find ways to build alliances and reach across and to break through this kind of binary, as you're saying, of a secular 
Islamist or uh, religious secular divide and to, to work through that and to try to dismantle that binary as, as well. I will, I will start with the most difficult. I don't know about feminist government. I don't even know whether we need feminist government. I think we need, um, and I, I would not think about it in these terms, but I think that there are various ways in, um, and various um, practices um, and policies that can uh, help women enter into public uh, and political life, and therefore create a culture in which it, there will be no need for feminist government, there will be a government. And, um, and, I, and I think, so the institutions such as, or policies such as quota, we are all very critical towards quotas, but at the same time, um, women need to have a place to show, to show themselves and how they think and how innovative they could be. And if we want to allow them that to have, if we want to create that uh, system, they, will, they may have much more, the process might, um, uh, might, may take much longer. Um, in European Union, you might know, there is this whole uh, policy or, uh, or practice of policy of gender mainstreaming. You cannot actually debate any aspect of, um, of public and political life without taking women into account. And not women actors, but women and women issues. And the, 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 the fact that, that, that women and men are not absolutely identical in everything, and that has to be taken into account. The fact that women do uh, mostly help in raising children, and therefore there had, had to be certain allowances made. So there are institutions that, that can help democracy to, to do that without trying to appear that we need a feminist government. I, I think it may be just a, a misfortunate name, but I, I um, yeah. Uh, so I don't know. About religion. Well, Polish Pope, it was a huge gift to us to have the Pope. You cannot, I mean, one cannot underestimate that. When this guy, who was a great actor, but also an amazing human being, came to Warsaw in 79, first time, and everybody went on the street. You know, we had our own Tahrir Square before even Tahrir Square happened in Poland, and it happened only a year later, in 1980. We saw each other, and the first thing he said, in this huge square in the Palace of Culture, um, in front of Palace of Culture, which is called the Square of Joseph Stalin, with a huge cross <laughs> in front of Joseph Stalin, a monument. Um, you know, there was not enough, and we could not fit there. I mean, it's as huge as Tahrir Square, but you, you, I mean, and he said, do not fear. And you know, it was so important, language works. Th those things worked, and next year, <laughs> Valentinovich, who was never a feminist, you know, I hope, I mean, I'm so pleased that she never ended up in, um, the, the, the woman I showed you here, that was the reason for the strike, and was very, very courageous, and who, who ended up being extremely conservative, and actually working against women's issues at the end. But Valentinovich listened, and she said, I want to do something, you know, and, and, and it gave people a sense of, you know, I mean, we think that it cannot be any worse. So I would not underappreciate the role of religion at all, but I do think that it is, at the end, when it comes to creating a, a, in a situation of state, of creating of institutions, and institutions is a private matter. And it should be completely, we, of course, we, I don't have to talk about it, but we understand each other. This is a separate, and also cult, but the religion is also part of culture, and I, this is what I was trying to criticize. It has a very, very uh, strong grip on everybody, and it shaped us, you know, the way we are, our identities at the time, uh, well, way back, and we have to work against it, because otherwise we are framed, indeed. Um, new institutions. I actually think that, uh, that all those new movements, all those new, new, new social movements, um, which, um, which are about voices and are, which are about raised voices and which are about speech and which are about getting to know each other and speaking and debating, they have a huge capacity and huge potential in inventing new institutions. I think that there are institutions and we should have courts and we should have parliaments, that, but you know, there are things that people know and I, I don't know much about Egypt, but there are probably practices which help people over generations to, uh, to live in the society and they could be brought into um, and, 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 and inspire a building of a, or kind of tweaking democratic institutions which are known in the, known in the West. It should not be just, it, it doesn't have to be just you know, you know, uh, uh, applied um, mechanically. And the last thing that I wanted to say is that the movements towards democracy, the, 
the, the, the, the transformations are also very capable in creating new practices and, and, new, uh, and new institutions, such as institutions that you yet don't have it, but you probably will have it because at some point the society will have to sit down society and not just uh, elite with elite, two establishments, um, sit together and negotiate the future Egypt or future of. Um, so you need a round table. And this is a very interesting new idiom that was, um, uh, that was invented during, at the end of the century with Spain with South Africa, with Poland, which allowed for the nonviolent revolution to happen. And, and, the, uh, and the new and democracies which emerged are not just a, uh, are not just a copy cuts of, the, of whatever other democracies are in the West. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.